The Centre for Computing History in Haverhill near Cambridge houses a collection of these fourth generation machines. In the early 80s, around 30 independent computer manufacturers could be found in Cambridge and the surrounding area. One of the best selling computers of this time was the BBC Micro, designed and manufactured by a small Cambridge company called Acorn. Chris Turner was Acorn's chief engineer at the time. How many people would work on something like that in terms of designing and building it? What sort of size team would you have? A relatively small team. I mean, at Acorn in the early days, there were maybe six to ten of us working on these things. So mm. somebody like myself stitching all of the hardware together, somebody else working on the operating system. So this is a wildly different company to the company that produced the ICL, for example, where there have been very large numbers of people. Oh, like yes. I mean, these VLSI chips created the, the opportunity for relatively small teams of people to get together and very quickly implement uh, a, a single board computer. And, and, and so, uh, of course, Acorn is, is well known because of its success with the BBC Micro, but there were lots of other computer companies springing up around the same time. Dragon, Tangerine, Oric, Sinclair, of course, our main competitor. <laughs> and that was just in the UK. Uh, in the States, of course, we had Apple, Commodore, Tandy. And so this industry grew very, very quickly, and um, it was enabled by the progress in semiconductor manufacturing, according essentially to Moore's law that says, you know, for every 18 months or thereabouts, you get um, twice as many transistors on, on, on a chip for the mm. same, same cost or the, or the same area, yeah. um, which means that, you know, whilst we have, you know, tens of thousands of transistors on the chips on this wafer, today's chips have each have billions of transistors yeah. on and those of course are the chips that are in that um, inside your smartphone and your, your latest netbook and yeah. all of those products today. And how, what's the power consumption, I mean ignoring the monitor for a minute, what sort of power consumption would you expect for the, uh, for the computer Well not itself? so much really, I mean power density in terms of you know the size of products remains mm. pretty much the same. Um, I mean, this is, uh, I think, a 5 volt, 3 amp power supply in the BBC Micro, so 15, 20 watts. So tell us something about the democratisation of the industry, Chris, because at this point, for the first time, you suddenly start t selling to individuals, whereas before you were selling to large industries. Well, that's right. And, and, and uh, I've thought since that this, this period was something of a perfect storm that created our personal computer or microcomputer industry because you had this enablement of in particular the semiconductor technology but you also had this perception or demand that was drawing the perceived need to have a computer out of just companies and into small businesses and homes. Mm -hmm. People were beginning to use computers for databases in small businesses, mailing lists and keeping track of orders and things of that nature. But then, of course, you had the popularisation of computers that you, that you saw on uh, television programmes. HAL in 2001, Zen in, in Blake 7, I suppose Asimov's robots for us, those of us into science fiction. But there was a general feeling that, you know, computers were the way forward. By the end of the 80s, the huge choice of office computers had narrowed and many machines became evolutionary dead ends. Over the four generations, we've seen big changes in the technology. We've also seen a move towards greater usability, popularity and portability, as well as massive reductions in price. The industry is probably as creative today as it ever was. It would be fascinating to see what Tommy Flowers, the engineer behind Colossus, would have made of all this.